not now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Check one, check two. All right. Well, thank you very much for, uh, give me one moment here, make sure I can get this. I did it. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for coming back today, everybody. This will be our uh, last day of sessions. And in this session, we will be dealing with the topic of God's calling. And the title of the lesson is God Called You, But You Hung Up. Okay. Has anybody ever hung up on you before in a phone call? You don't forget that. You never forget that. Um, <clears throat> so, the, uh, the overview, just as a reminder of what took place yesterday, and a lot of things were covered, they were important topics. God's will, we found, is revealed. It's in Christ, not you. It's perfect for everyone, not just for you. It is uh, dispensational. Dispensationally, it changes. God's will is working through faith and not sight. And those are the things that we learned yesterday. You could also summarize sessions one through five, which were yesterday, as what God did, what He does, and what He will do. Sessions six through eight today, you can see as how we participate in that will until glory. Okay? That's an overview for today. Uh, the expression, God's calling for my life, on my life, is very popular. Um, <clears throat> People seek these things out. They want to know what it is. And for Christians, if you were to take the session that I taught yesterday, the perfect plan for my life, uh, it is finding God's calling. That's how people conceptualize that. Uh, another way to think of that would be what God has made you for. Hey, what has He made you for? And alas, most Christians don't know the calling of God. Instead of seeing Him as their maker, they see Him as a career counselor or a life coach and the call to glorify God, they say, is found in their worldly pursuits, their earthly vocations, their gifts, their aptitudes, and their religious practices. That's how it manifests. They believe that in those things that they do, that is what glorifies God. That is what they're called to do. Have you heard that before? I have heard that many times. I have thought that many times. Instead of a high, heavenly, holy, and hopeful calling... They make it low, they make it earthly, they make it carnal, and they make it vain. It's temporal. And we need to be better students of the Scripture than that. We, may, we need to be better uh, persuaded about the truth. Because missing God's calling is a thing that happens for the Christian. They participate in that and that He saved them. We'll talk more about that. But they don't see it. They don't understand what it is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1... In verse 26, Paul says, For ye see your calling, brethren, how not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty, essentially those that see the world as their gain and their success, uh, they do not see their calling effectively. They're confounded. They don't understand what it is that God's doing. And he is seeking to communicate to the Corinthians, Ye see your calling, and it's not this. It's being made in Christ all the riches of His grace and glory given to you. So missing God's calling, its hope, its freedom, is simply unwise, and it is unworthy. And we'll try to expound upon that in this lesson. So the first thing is that confusion about God's call is not a new thing in the church, the body of Christ. When Paul was operating, when he was ministering, when he was sent forth, called by God, and given as a chosen vessel and a pattern with the gospel of the grace of God to establish a foundation of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, in the dispensation of the grace of God, they had the same issues. Okay? It's the issues of the flesh. It's the issues of not seeing the calling and not walking worthy of it. And so, I've got a list of questions um, that I want to go through that I think will touch on how people think about the calling and to answer affirmatively no or definitively no to each of these questions. The first question is, does God's calling change? And in Romans 11 verse 29, Paul gives a conclusion of whether or not his calling, his gifts change. Now the question was, 
members of the body of Christ, those individuals that understood the ministry that he was given, what he was communicating through his ministry, is whether or not the body of Christ in Israel's calling, or confusing the body of Christ in Israel's calling, whether or not uh, it was called into question, whether or not Israel's standing was still secure with God, whether or not he took the promises of God and he gave it to the church, the body of Christ. In other words, what happened to Israel? And that question, and those gifts, and that calling, and that salvation that was promised unto them according to their covenants, he says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. So the calling of God is not something that changes, okay? That's important to note. There's a distinction between whom he called. I don't mean to confuse that. But the question for people in this day and age is, does his calling change? And it doesn't, okay? Is it special and unique? Is the calling special and unique? The answer is no. This vainglory caused division in the body of Christ at Corinth. And if you read through 1 Corinthians, you'll see that that is the major issue. This is why Paul addresses in the first chapter many times mentioning the word call or called or calling. All of it is to the fellowship of Christ. All of it is as one body. And he asks the resounding question, is Christ divided? He's not. So if the calling of God is special and unique, Christ is divided, and He's not. So it's not special and unique. Is it for the most religious ones of us? I don't have a calling, but this person does. You might think that I have a calling that you do not, and that's not true. I don't have a different calling than you. It's not for the most religious. Neither salvation nor the calling of God is by works. Titus 3, 5, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done that we are saved. We're saved by His mercy. We're saved by His grace. In 2 Timothy 1, 9, the calling of God is that He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So it's not for the most religious that they receive a call, because that is simply something that is of works. Is it under the law? Well, the answer is no. This perversion was dealt with in Galatia. They sought uh, promises, uh, or rather received the calling of God and into His grace, the grace of Christ, and they were perverted in their understanding of what the gospel, the grace of God was. Paul answers that basically you're making the cross and the grace of Christ of none effect. If you think you're justified by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And so it's not under the law. He declares that they are fallen from grace. And that is to not know your calling, right? It's to not stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Is it in the world? Is the calling of God in the world? Is that where you find it? The answer is no. This road of fleshly desire has always obscured seeing our hope. In Ephesians 1 and verse 18, he describes and prays unto God that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Right? That they would know the hope of their calling, that they would know the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of His power to us word who believe. That's by the power of resurrection. And so, is this in the world? No. In Ephesians 2, He answered that you were dead in trespasses and sins, and that you walked according to the course of the world, and you fulfilled the desires of the flesh and the mind. We already know naturally where that leads. We know the conclusion of that story and that road. So know your calling is not found in the world. You'll notice that I'm working through Paul's epistles right now, dealing with the confusion that they had concerning their calling. Is it achievement? No. Flesh confidence and an earthly focus always keeps us from reaching the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? In Philippians 3 and verse 14, Paul describes that he forgets those things which are behind, and he reaches forth unto those things which are before, and he presses toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Any confidence in the flesh is contrary to the calling of God in Christ. Okay? Your confidence and your worship of God is through the Spirit. Okay? It's not your achievements. Is it abstinence? And that's a big topic. Right? Is it abstinence? Is it what you don't do? Is it the thing that you keep yourself from? The answer is no. In Colossians 2, verses 20 to 23, there's some stern statements concerning those that are puffed up in their fleshly mind. They do not hold the head, Colossians 2. They are essentially finding life in the rudiments of the world, and he says you're dead with Christ. 
Remember that. If you be dead with Christ, why are you subject to these ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not abstinence, right? And his conclusion about that is that it is a show um, for the flesh to say, I do not partake of this, right? And this makes me lay hold on God's calling. It confuses things. Um, that is a worship of your will. That is dishonorable unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That is something that simply your flesh wants to do. That's religious flesh. And the Colossians dealt with that issue. Is it indulgence then on the other side of things? No. The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. 1 Corinthians 6 makes that abundantly clear. While all things are lawful, not all things are expedient. Okay? So we have to be wise in understanding that the calling is neither abstinence, what you don't do, it's neither indulgence, the things that you partake of. You're free to serve Christ. That's the calling of God. Is it affliction from God? Have you been called unto affliction and suffering? You know, this is something that people are confused with. And the Colossians, or rather the Thessalonians, they dealt with this issue. Okay? This fails to discern the dispensation of God's grace that we live in. Okay? Whether or not you're receiving affliction from God. 1 Thessalonians 1, 1, 10, and 5, 9 describe that you're delivered from the wrath to come. Right? And they were sought, or rather exhorted, to walk worthy of the calling of God, and they were not discerning the times. Okay? So that's something. Is it just for old people, the calling of God? Is that something that you have to mature into in terms of age? I figure out what I want to do. I have the calling of God, and it comes after you know, the age of accountability, or when I finish high school, or something like that, right? when I figure out what I want to do. And the answer is no to all of these questions. This places an age limit on receiving a call from God, and that is not the case, okay? You can see many examples, and they're quite a joy uh, for us to be able to see youth in the Lord that are walking worthy, that they're being an example unto the believers. We ought to see that because it's not for the old that receive a calling from God. It is quite a benefit and what a blessing to know the call of God when you're young so that you might walk in that. It's not just for old people. That's a ridiculous notion. You are saved and you are called. 2 Timothy 1 describes that. Saved us and called us. And that's important to know. So let's move forward in defining how God has called us. He saved us and He called us for a heavenly conversation. The definition of calling is a summons or an inviting, a naming, a vocation. Even in some cases, it's a class of persons engaged in any employment. Okay? In that sense, it could be singular or plural. It could be something that is just naming something. It's what you call it. I call this my daughter. Right? Or I call this a chair. This is a name that you apply to something. And yet, there is a much broader definition to that. And the calling of God includes all of these things, right? When God speaks, He speaks declaratively, He speaks truthfully, He calls things what they are. Um, he also calls those things which be not as though they were. And that's important too. God sees things differently, calls things differently. And we ought to know those distinctions. A calling can be described as who you are, that's your identity. Uh, what your position is, that could be considered your title. And also, what is to be done? Your duty. Okay? Your identity, your title, your duty. That's a way that you can think about calling. Calls are made to begin or continue a conversation. We make calls all the time. People receive calls all the time. If you factor in email, people get emails all the time. That's a call. You're receiving a call. Maybe you don't answer that call, but you receive them. So people are calling all the time. You have voices in you that call out for things, and you have the world that speaks to you. They call you into something. It happens all the time. There are many voices. And when you hang up on someone, it is stopping the conversation. That's what a hang up is. And again, if you've had that happen, it is memorable. So a biblical conversation, or rather, let, let me say this. There, there have been some prominent biblical hang-ups. Um, I thought this was interesting to kind of think about. Adam and Eve essentially was a, was a big hang-up there. Okay, when sin entered, there was a conversation that had begun with them, and that would be the first that we might look at in humanity of a, of a hang-up, right? 
They ended that conversation. Now, God continued to communicate. God continued to intervene. God continued to do things. But when you choose to go your own way, essentially you're hanging up that conversation. Even before that, though, Satan would be a pretty big hang-up, right? Created by God, fallen in sin, trafficking in iniquity. He had a calling. God had a purpose there. And he hung up, right? The consequences of those two hang-ups are why we're here talking today about God's grace and His calling. You have uh, Solomon in Ecclesiastes, essentially in the latter portion of his ministry. You can look at Ecclesiastes as a, as a hang-up, right? He uh, received wisdom of God. He operated magnificently by God's grace and the instructions that were given to him. He led, he judged, he was a great king. And then the last portion, he hung up. Right? And Ecclesiastes is essentially that transcript <laughs> of hanging up on God and pursuing a worldly conversation. We have the conclusion of that conversation. That's a pretty big hang up in the scriptures. Old Testament Israel, over and over again they hung up that call. There were only certain ones that were keeping that conversation going. Right? There was a point at which that, uh, they lost you know, the word of God, the law of God, and then they found it. Josiah picked that conversation up. And, of course, all humanity. In Romans 1 and verse 28, essentially we do not like to retain God in our knowledge, and He gives man over to those things which are not convenient. So a hang-up is pretty significant, and it happens quite often, and we understand that concept quite well. A biblical conversation can be considered the walk, right? The way you live your life, a way of life. That's how the Bible talks about a conversation. It can be religious, it can be fleshly, um, it can be worldly, and it can be heavenly. All of the verses that support that you can find in the scriptures. For example, look at Galatians 1. When we talk about the, the God called you, but you hung up, um, we're talking about a conversation that was initiated by God and whether or not we continue that. In Galatians 1 and verse 13, Paul describes, Ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood." Okay, so that gives you the use of the word called and also conversation uh, in the same context. Okay, Paul's conversation in time past was one that was religiously... And we talked last um, or yesterday uh, about his perfect resume, right? The, the confidence in the flesh that he was describing that he counted as dung for the knowledge of Christ most excellent. So a biblical conversation is what you are... Uh, the manner in which you're living, the thing that you're engaged, employed in, the place where you find life, it's, it's the way you're conducting yourself in this world. In Ephesians 2 and verse 3, you see that there's you know, the conversation that we all had in time past, and that is the course of the world. And then if you look at Philippians chapter 3, you'll see that Paul describes where our conversation ought be oriented. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, Paul describes, Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's a heavenly conversation. So those are the differences, right? That you can have a religious, a worldly, a fleshly, or a heavenly conversation. And Paul, of course, who is our pattern, is able to show us a conversation that you could have and you should hang up on, and then a conversation that you could pick up. Okay? The, the, the contrast is there in the same individual. And so when we talk about a biblical conversation, we need to know how did this conversation begin? And this conversation began with the gospel of the grace of God. God called you, and that was Him commending His love and His grace 
in the gospel, okay, the preaching of the cross. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 14. This is a helpful passage when thinking about God's calling, how He calls, how the conversation began. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 14, I'll start in verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit uh, and belief of the truth. Whereunto, verse 14, He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how God called unto His purpose? What means He used to call? It was the gospel. He called you unto salvation, sanctification, that was through the Spirit, and glory through the cross of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, he describes that the preaching of the cross, for us which are saved, that the preaching of the cross is to them which perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And then he goes on to describe how they are to see their calling found in Christ. God called you by the gospel, and he called you unto glory. Now, the answering of that call is faith. Okay? When you believe that call that God made in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the power of God and salvation. When you heard the gospel and you believed it, you were saved. In Ephesians 1, this is very helpful in using this verse to understand the answering of the call. In Ephesians 1, in verse 13, we read, In whom ye also trusted, that speaking of Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Do you see how that connects with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, or 13 through 15 that I read? He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He chose you, that's the purpose that God gave in Christ, the delivery of that message, that offer for salvation, that call that God gave to enter into that was done by the gospel. When you believed it, you were sealed and sanctified by the Spirit. Put those two passages together so that you can make them work. Okay, that's, that's what God is doing. He is sanctifying you in Christ, setting you apart for His holy purpose. That's your answer to the call, is believing it. The gospel of the grace of God, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, give us that we are saved. That's the standing that the Corinthians had in the preaching of the cross. You've got to take verses uh, in chapter 1 and chapter 15, put them together, the preaching of the cross, the gospel of the grace of God. That is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay? That salvation, that hope that we have, is in the resurrection and the glory of Christ that is to be held. So that is the calling and the answering. You stand by faith and you are sanctified in Christ. And so a new conversation began. Your old conversation, your former conversation, that of the world, that of the flesh, that of yourself, that conversation ended. Okay? As far as God is concerned, you are identified in Christ the moment that you believe the gospel. He calls you unto it, you answer it, and He has saved us and called us with a holy calling. That calling is the same thing as salvation. It's what you were called unto. It's the purpose that God called you unto. And that is what I mean by a new conversation began. Whether or not you continue with that, that is the conversation that began. That is the position that you hold in Christ. He desires a new conversation. All right? God set you apart for a holy conversation. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, uh, God desires all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And that's the way that you ought to think about the conversation. The coming unto the knowledge of the truth. 
of the truth. And so, we are at the proverbial hang-up here. Since you can't hold two conversations at once, one of them must end. Okay? You cannot have two conversations at once. I've tried it. it. It doesn't happen. If somebody else comes up and tries to talk to you, it happens frequently at the seminars. You've got two individuals that are trying to speak. You can't listen to both of them. And so one patiently waits while the other person finishes the conversation. You cannot have two conversations at once. Things get confused pretty quick. They get confounded. Um, they are really hard to discern. And so you have an old conversation versus a new conversation. For more on that, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 2, he talked about the conversation in time past and the lusts of your flesh. And that was a position that you held uh, quite well and you felt fine in it. There wasn't anything that was telling you that that was, that was wrong. God's Word is telling you that that was wrong. You were dead in trespasses and sins. That was the conversation. We had it with everybody. But in uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 17, Paul declares and testifies in the Lord that we henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of our mind, having our understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto another conversation. That's the way you could see that. Unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. And yet verses 20 through 23 and 24 describe this new conversation. How you are to hang up on one and pick up the other. Now again, from God's perspective, this conversation began. You're sanctified in Christ. It's whether or not you're going to continue the conversation. That's really what it is. So the hang up here is that a person could just continue to choose to walk in vanity that had been saved unto glory. Okay? And sadly, many choose to hang up on God and continue their former conversation. But we have not so learned Christ, if so be that we have heard Him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put off on the new man. Uh, that is the conversation that God desires to have. Right? That's what he set before us. This new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay? And that is what you have been set apart to put on. Now, Paul desired many times to have a different conversation with those that he had initiated one with. Okay? He got the gospel unto them, and in 1 Corinthians 3, he says, I can't speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. In other words, I can't have the conversation that I want to have with you, right? the one that we began, because you do not see your calling, 1 Corinthians 1. You don't see it. 1 Corinthians 2, the Spirit has revealed it. He's teaching you we have the mind of Christ, but you're not having it. right? You're having a different mind. I can't talk to you the way that I want to, the way that we need to. And he asked the question, are you not carnal and walk as men? Right? They, they did not understand the conversation. Okay, it was divided. They had problems. And so... What I meant to say in that section is that God desires, He called you, He saved you, and called you unto a heavenly conversation, and that we simply choose to hang up on that one, right? We choose the other conversation. And it's not as simple as saying, you know, like, I know it's a bad conversation. People don't typically like to have bad conversations. You've had them, you don't want to have them, so you end them. But this conversation that God is saying is a, a bad, an evil, and a wicked conversation is deceiving unto you. You don't see it that way, so you don't want to hang up that call. But he's saying, you need to. And that's the calling. God has called you unto a different conversation. So, in this last section here, we'll deal with the truth. Your calling is your position in Christ, and it is for everyone in the body of Christ. That's the truth of it all. In Ephesians 1 and verse 18, he says that you would know the hope of your calling. Right? And the hope of his calling could be put like this, the body gloriously conformed unto the head. Okay? The body gloriously conformed unto the head. In Romans 8, 29, you'll see that the purpose of God is that Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren. We'd be conformed 
unto his image. In Ephesians 3.19, Paul's describing in that prayer when he bows his knees unto the Father, and he mentions that you, you bear the name of Christ, all heaven and earth. That's a calling. But he describes that he, he wants you to be filled with, uh, with all his fullness. Okay, that Christ would dwell in your hearts by faith. Um, that is a calling. He wants to fill you. Okay, that's the hope of your calling that he would. In Ephesians 4.13, that you would grow up into the head and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the hope of the calling. Okay, that's the conversation he began, and that's, that's its end state. That's, that's what he sees. That's what he wants to see. So then in this conversation that's been begun by salvation, right, the offer of it, the call, and you being found in Christ, that conversation began. You can't end that conversation. That's a conversation that definitively God defines you, names you, he calls you a new creature in Christ. But it's from your perspective. What are you going to do with that knowledge? So how do I listen to this conversation or in this conversation? How do I listen? And this is a, you know, something that you want to teach someone how to listen. One thing that I saw uh, at a job that I held before it was a situation where one, one employee was being rebuked by a supervisor. And when the individual tried to answer back to the person who clearly was leadership at that point, he stopped him in his tracks and said, you're in receive mode right now. And what that meant was, I'm talking to you and you need to shut up and listen. That's it. And we need to be in that posture. We have to know that God is the one that's going to tell us what the problem is. We have to know that he's the one that is calling the shots. Okay? He has to tell us that. We have to have the manner and the posture to listen to that. And so that is the coming unto the knowledge of the truth. God saved you so that you would listen. Okay? He saved you that you would engage in this conversation in a manner that is appropriate. And so... In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 1 through 3, you'll see that the commandment of God that was given by Jesus Christ through the Apostle Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus was that they would know how to possess their vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay? That that was the will of God, their sanctification. That they would know it. Know who I made you and walk accordingly. And so, in this conversation, to listen means that you have to know how God sees you. You have to know that He sees you as a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, sanctified, redeemed, justified, and complete, Colossians 2.10. You're complete in Christ. You have to know when you're listening in this conversation what He calls you. He calls you spiritual because the Spirit of God dwells in you. He calls you a son because he has adopted you through that same spirit. He calls you a saint because you are sanctified in Christ. And he calls you a member, an ambassador, and he calls you an, an evangelist, and he calls you a steward. These are things that he calls you in the scriptures. So when you listen in this conversation, listen for what you are called. What the vocation is, is something you need to listen to as well. I mentioned this as being your duty. Membership in his body for the perfecting ministry work of the saints. In uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 12 through 13, it gives you that description. Right? We all have received the same measure of God's grace in verse 8, and it's for a purpose. And the purpose is for the edifying of the body of Christ, the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry. You have to listen in this conversation for what the vocation is. What is it that I've actually been set apart to participate in? You have to see your calling. How he's prepared you, he's equipped you. That's through the Spirit, his Word, fellow members, and we saw a lot of that yesterday, right? How do you discern, you know, life? What is it that God has said to you? How does he speak to you? Does that through his Spirit, his Word, fellow members. And then how he works. You have to know, how's this whole thing going to work out? Like, how... How is God going to get this done? That's the right way to think about that. And also, how, how can I make sure that I understand that so I don't get in the way? And for this, it's by His Spirit in you. It's through prayer. And it is by His 
faith. And a good example for that, which I won't spend for the sake of time, but I would like you to just have this in your mind when you look at Philippians 1, when Paul's describing that God began a good work in you, and He will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. And then later in the verses, he's saying that, that you need to be able to discern the most excellent things, essentially, being sincere and without offense into the day of Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2, he's describing that it is God that works in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure, but also that you need to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's a cooperation that needs to take place. You need to know how He works. It's God that works in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. Philippians 1 describes to you how you can look at your circumstances and be delivered from the wrong thinking through a prayer and supply the Spirit of Jesus Christ so that you have an unashamed hope. And so that is how you should listen. How He sees you. How do you see me, God? What do you call me? What is the vocation? How have you equipped me? And how do you work? How's this going to work out? That's how you listen in this conversation. Now, how do you hold a good conversation, though? How do you hold one? How do you speak back? Should you at all? Um, how, what's your involvement here? And so, this I'm defining as thinking and acting in a manner that is worthy of the fellowship. Okay, a conversation and becoming conversant with someone is that you, you're keeping the company, right? You're keeping the conversation. You're holding the conversation. You are there. You are focused and you seek to contribute. You want to be a part of that and you desire such a thing. Look in Philippians 1 really fast. How do you hold a good conversation? Now this is mentioned in Philippians 1. I should have just brought you there because I'm taking you there anyway. In verse 27, Paul's describing as he is thinking about his own calling. Right? He says, I have a desire to be with Christ, but it's more needful that I abide here in the flesh. So he was in a strait betwixt two, and you could say that, you know, he was looking at two different callings. <laughs> it's the same one unto Christ, but also for his body. And in this uh, uh, chapter, he mentions essentially how they are to conduct themselves. In verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh, that is, being worthy of, in line with, in accordance with, appropriate for, as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that's your conversation, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Okay, that's how you hold a conversation. You do not need the person that began the conversation with you in terms of the apostle. That's his exhortation, is that you can continue this conversation. I'm still keeping it while I'm in jail. Keep the conversation. Don't hang up. So, to act and to think, to think and act in a manner worthy of the fellowship, is something uh, that, that means holding a good conversation. It's how you hold it. Now, two things that you can consider here would be walking worthy of the vocation and also of the Lord. Okay? Walking worthy of the vocation and the Lord. And if you look at Colossians chapter 1, actually uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 12. 2 Corinthians 12. I'll try to wrap things up here. 2 Corinthians 12. And we talked yesterday about the same earnest care that Titus had placed into his heart. And that was him being conformed unto the, the will and the wisdom and the purpose that God had to bestow grace upon those believers that he sought uh, to help. Okay, that was, the, that was the care that he had. And when we talk about walking worthy, making choices in wisdom with the knowledge of God's will, that's pleasing unto the Lord. That's walking worthy of the Lord. You know what He said, what He set you apart to. You use His words. You engage in His will. You're not inventing something. You're taking line by line what He said, and you're doing it. That's pleasing unto Him when you do God's will. Okay? And walking worthy of the vocation might be your motivation toward other members of the body and your conduct with them. Okay? That's a way to think about those two. And here's a way that I think it, it can be conceptualized or seen in action uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 18. 
I'll start in verse uh, 17. Paul speaking here, Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? Did I make a gain of you? I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? That's the idea, the distinction between these two. Walking worthy of the Lord, walking worthy of the vocation, is walking in the same pleasing steps, doing the Lord, or doing the Lord's will, doing that which He sent you to do, but also with the same gracious spirit, seeking to hold the same conversation with others. And that's Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. Take a look at that really quick. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, Paul describes in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Here's your mind. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the same conversation. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling. Okay. So walking worthy of the Lord and walking worthy of the vocation is the steps you take, the choices that you make with the knowledge of God's will, but also in what spirit are you doing that? It's not just what you're doing, it's how you're doing that. It's how you're thinking about it, others, and your heart in the whole matter as unto the Lord. So a way to think about walking worthy of the vocation is seeing people the same way that Christ sees them. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And we know no man after the flesh, even Christ himself. So we have to make the right judgment after listening in the conversation to what the Lord has said concerning your calling. Now you must adopt that same conversation and decide to have that with others. But it's not just doing the thing, it's how you're doing it. That's very important. The Lord is able to see your heart. You're not fooling anyone when you're putting on a vain show. So walk worthy of the vocation by seeing them the same way, calling them the same thing, right? Do not make judgments only according to the flesh regarding a person's position in Christ. Listen to their testimony. The other side of that coin is that they need to be conformed unto Christ and have the same conversation. But you need to see them the same way, calling them the same thing and caring for them the same way. You utilize that which God has equipped you with to minister unto those who are fellow members of the body or potential members, right? Pressing toward the same mark is a worthy walk of the vocation, right? It's worthy of the vocation. And supplying by the same gracious measure. We have all in Ephesians 4 and verse 8 received God's all-sufficient grace to do that work that you see in verse 16. Right? Supplying by the same gracious measure, growing up into the same head. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I talked about this yesterday in the questions. I think that it is um, it's a magnificent verse. Uh, it's one worthy of committing to your memory, understanding the concept that's being put forth here, and rejoicing in it. In Verse 12 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. And that, that's that in a nutshell there, that God has saved you and called you um, unto a holy calling. And that calling there we ought to walk worthy of, and we need to listen in that conversation that began. And we ought to conclude that God has called us, and we ought not to hang up on that conversation. Okay? Are there any questions?